I'm so excited about this conversation because uh, what Quibi is, and I'm about to ask what is Quibi, is uh, a marriage of uh, Hollywood and Silicon Valley. And I've taken a personal interest in it, but Hollywood and Silicon Valley have taken an interest in it. And when you talk to folks uh, in, in both of those places, what I tend to hear, I, I hear two things, always in the same order. They say, it's exciting, but they're not sure it's going to work because they're not sure there's a market demand for it. They're not sure people uh, actually want to watch premium content in six to 10 minute snippets. And uh, even if they did, they're not entirely sure that that content is going to look like what Quibi is making. But then the second thing they all say is you never bet against Jeffrey Katzenberg and you never bet against Meg Whitman. So, to that end, uh, and, and by the way, the, the Hollywood studios have bet heavily on you. Uh, they've all put in a, their little piece to see if this thing is going to work out. So, you guys have spent so much time hustling and making the pitch to businesses, to advertisers. What is the pitch to consumers? What is Quibi and why should anyone in this room or anywhere care? Yeah. So I think you captured some of it, which is we are trying to bring together the best of Silicon Valley and the best of Hollywood. And we are creating the first entertainment platform that um, is, makes every moment of your day extraordinary. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But we are creating a platform that brings together quick bite content, so less than 10 minutes, as you said, created by Hollywood's top talent, and combining that with a technology platform that makes viewing short form video on your mobile extraordinary. Engaging and doing some things today, watching um, video on your mobile is great, but it can be a lot better. So Quibi is short for Quick Bytes, and Jeffrey, I've heard you, people always talk about it as premium short form. You don't think of it as short form, you think of it as long form broken up into little bits. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually want to add a little bit to your first question. So first of all, um, uh, make, make no mistake about it, Meg and I, you know, we understand uh, the challenge that we're taking on, the uniqueness. Um, it's hard to ask people's opinion about something that they've never experienced before. We, we have a, a promise that in terms of what it is that we want to bring to um, uh, consumers out there in the world, for which there's never been anything like it before. So, you know, it's, it's tough to, to be judgmental about that. Mm -hmm. um, and we recognize how hard what we are doing. Um, you know, we would say to you that what we're setting out to do falls somewhere between improbable and impossible. Mm -hmm. That just happens to be our home address, <laughs> and we love that. And that's part of why we're doing this, because it is. But to ask, answer a question here, if you go back to the late 80s and early 90s, when broadcast television was at its pinnacle of success um, and an audience, you had multiple TV shows like Seinfeld, Friends, ER, with audiences of more than 40 million people a week. And a company called HBO comes along and says, we're not TV. They're not denigrating TV. They're not putting it down. And we are not putting down short form at all in any fashion, shape, or form. But what they did say is, is that we're going to give you an experience that is a premium of that world. What did they do? They eliminated commercials. They changed the form and format of narrative, of storytelling, so they weren't constrained by 3060, 1326, which is what networks did. They were not restrained by standards and practices so that you could have uh, things like Soprano or Sex in the City or The Wire, which things are actually could not be on broadcast TV. They spent money that once again in a broadcast world, they couldn't compete with it. So 20 years ago, they ordered 10 episodes of Band of Brothers for $125 million, mm -hmm. right? That's like $30 million an episode today. And then finally, they offered a creative challenge and a creative opportunity for storytellers that was unique and differentiated from broadcast TV. Everything they did to differentiate themselves from television is what Quibi is doing to differentiate itself from YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. But let's talk about the way that you're differentiating yourself because it is mobile entertainment. It is, it is thinking about the world through a mobile lens. And yet, it, it sounds like to me some of the you know, early shows, the, the talent that you've signed on for this, 
it sounds to me like maybe this is bringing the television experience to the phone. It's bringing the talent, and it's bringing that storytelling. So now let me go back and answer your question about what differentiates this in it. So you have to I ask that you think about this in the context of the, there, there have been two sort of um, uh, forms of uh, film narrative. The first form was movies. Movies are two to two and a half hours in length, and they are designed to be watched in a single sitting. We've been doing that for 110 years. Mm -hmm. The next form of film narrative was television. Came along in the 1950s, and the form and format was principally one hours, and one hours that were either episodic or serialized, stories that were told over an, an arc or uh, procedurals that you know, would be one and, and done in it, but basically they were designed to be watched an hour at a time with act breaks, very specifically. An episode of broadcast TV or cable TV is 42 minutes and 30 seconds, precisely, literally to the second. And the first act break at the end of This Is Us every single week is eight and a half minutes. So that enterprise has been around for 70 years. What we're doing with Quibi is actually bringing those two creative narrative forces together. So for Quibi, a series, a lighthouse for us, is a two to two and a half hour story told in act breaks that are eight to 10 minutes long. Now I'm gonna reference another place of, film, of storytelling, not in film, where this has actually been tr tested and, and, and proven and actually worked quite well. And I'm gonna put Charles Dickens aside for a moment and just say that in books, novels, for many hundreds of years, a typical chapter in a typical novel was 20 to 40 pages long, and a chapter. And the reason for that is we read a page a minute and after 30 minutes our eyes get tired. Mm -hmm. And so editors told their authors, don't write them longer than that if you don't want someone to stop in the middle of a chapter. Dan Brown comes along. It's the one that the light bulb went off for me almost 20 years ago. And he writes The Da Vinci Code, 464 pages long, the, and it has 105 chapters. The average chapter is less than five pages. And I would argue there's absolutely nothing lesser about The Da Vinci Code other than the length of the chapters. And he said at the time, I don't know that my audience today with the constraints around their time. They have as many 30 and 40 minute chunks of time. So I'm going to give them this in a way they can consume it in bite sizes. You got 10 minutes, read a chapter or two. Got an hour, keep going. Quibi is doing exactly that same thing along of what we would call, look at as sort of movies. I guess what I wonder is if you are, if you are changing up the format in which you are telling the stories and if you are making it a mobile experience, do you need to think less about you know, we're still making TV, but we're, we're cutting it up, and think more about what the actual mobile experience is. Because if you talk to someone like Evan Spiegel at Snapchat, what he will, he, his number one thing that he always says when he gets on stage is the, the value of Snapchat is that your phone, when you open up, your phone opens onto the camera. And the experience is, it's not polished, it's not 1080, it's so much, it's rough around the edges, it's user generated. That right now is the kind of content people want when they have five minutes well, in well, the wait. checkout line. So, I was, all right, go well, on. I'd say just a couple of things. First of all, there's two things. One is this is a different use case. Okay, so remember, you leave every day with a television in your pocket. And you are off, and there's all these in-between moments where you have five to 10 minutes. Today, our target audience of 25 to 35-year-olds is focused on playing casual games, user-generated content, surfing the internet, whatever they're doing, we are going to give them an experience that they can't get today on their mobile phone. Not only the content and the quality of the content and the storytelling embedded therein, but also the ability to have an experience on the mobile that does not exist today. As I said before, when you watch your video on mobile today, it's a good experience, but it's not incredible. Right. Because if you are in portrait, as you just described with Evan, often if you click on a video, it's just what fills one third of the screen. If you turn to horizontal, which you cannot do on Snapchat, you have black lines on either side. And if you are watching Netflix on your phone, which not many do, what you have is a hard turn to landscape and there's no going back. And our use case is you may be on the bus in portrait, Looking at it in landscape, you get off the bus back in portrait. So we've created the ability to do full screen video seamlessly from landscape to portrait. And that goes all the way back to how the film is shot, how it's edited, how it's rendered, and then delivered on the phone. So, and even in terms of Dylan, which is, uh, Dylan, sorry, even in terms of Evan, Dylan, I don't, I don't think he or anyone else 
um, looks at Snapchat uh, as a storytelling platform. It's a communication and a sharing platform and mm -hmm. brilliant and he's brilliant, but it, it, is, it is designed for a very, very different use case and to that use case has been very effective. Also remember the demographic of that is 13 to 16 year olds. Mm -hmm. And your target, you said, is 25 to 35 year olds. Yeah, and it'll include probably seven years younger and seven years older. But the core audience. And is have, 25 I asked to this earlier, but has have you done the market research to show that there's demand for this? Or are you acting on the gut instinct that has proven well for both of you? Over well, I've been in you know in the consumer products business for you know nearly 30 years. It's very hard to do research and ask customers about something that doesn't exist today. Right. But what we know is that our users are watching a lot of video on mobile. They're excited about the opportunity to see something differentiated. But honestly, we're, we are using a lot of judgment, and uh, we'll know whether it works when, when it launches. So yes, it's informed by market research, but my experience is you never rely on that as a sole way yeah. to create an entirely new business and an entirely new category. Uh, let's assume that this works, and let's Good. assume this does very All right. well. <laughs> like that. Yeah, we got him to turn that corner. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no more questions. No, uh, let, uh, I'm sold. So let's say it does really well, and all of a sudden everyone is like, okay, you skated to where the puck was before you even knew it was going to be there. This is the future. We are living in the age of Quibi. If you've got Netflix, Amazon, Disney, Warner Media, all of these companies that can... Um, outscale you and outspend you, what's going to stop them from just keeping this, these shows that are being created, just putting them on their platforms, giving them to people who are already subscribed <coughs> to these services, and basically making Quibi the bridge that got us there, but you guys don't get to stick around for the party? So that's, that's, that's partially been off, uh, answered already by the way in which we have put Quibi together. So all of the entertainment studios, all eight of them, Disney, Comcast, uh, uh, AT&T, <laughs> Paramount, MGM, Lionsgate, all eight of the studios that actually represent about 80% of the show running talent yeah. and 90% of the IP <laughs> are investors in Quibi and more importantly than that have and are giving us access to their best show running talent and to their best IP. Now why are they all doing that? Um, in order for Quibi to work, there are two things that we actually have to achieve. One, we have to attain an, a, a level of, of, of quality that is unprecedented and people have not seen before. And we can give you the context of that. That's about giving, frankly, a lot of financial resources and making it financially rewarding for great talent to want to come work here. Mm -hmm. But the second part of it is, is that we have to have a volume of content in order for this to be worth a consumer to pay us a $5 a month subscription. There has to be enough content. And what everybody recognized is, is that no one studio actually could make the volume of content that it's going to take for Quibi to succeed. It's why we have all eight plus E1 of, uh, plus ITV, the two biggest independents. They're all making content for us because this is one of those moments in time that everybody recognized that one, it's a great growth initiative, a great growth opportunity for the entire uh, uh, industry, a Hollywood industry. Um, and I think that they uh, realized that unless everybody got in the boat at one time and all started rowing in one direction, no one could do this. So we spent a year and a half actually addressing exactly that thing. I mean, the other thing I think it's important to know, all, all everyone, you know, Amazon, Apple, uh, Netflix, HBO, Hulu, Showtime, all of them, they are all very focused on a very different use case. They basically make one hour television. And that television, interestingly enough, is watched less than 10% on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. And if you look at our use case, which is seven in the morning till seven at night, it's a small percentage of that 10%. Why is that? Well, if you're 25 to 35 years old, which I suspect is most of this audience today, and you have an hour of free time between seven in the morning and seven at night, you are highly underemployed, <laughs> right? Sure. So that's, we don't watch long form content during the day and very little of it is actually being watched on a smartphone. And that's where 
our content is only going to be. Here's the other thing I would say is this is the first platform that will launch where there is no library to buy. Sure. What you can't do is take an hour-long television show and chop it up into six, ten-minute segments. It has to be written and shot for this use case. And so we are making content as fast as we can with the help of all the major studios. And whoever starts later, and if we are successful, there will be plenty of competition, we will have accumulated a library that they can't go by. And so they start from a, a, you know, a, a standing start just like we do today. So I think that's a huge advantage and important to understand that there, there's no library to go by for this. Right. I think one thing I sort of envision about the future, if it works, is Bob Iger decides we want to do a two-hour season of a Star Wars offshoot. And if it's working so well that you could do like 12 episodes, 10 episodes, 10 minutes a piece for the episodes, why isn't he distributing that on Disney Plus? Why would he be distributing it on Quibi? Because that's not what his customers are, that's not their use case. Disney Plus is a, is a traditional, over-the-top service in which you are going to go there to get principally hour-long content. It's not designed to be watched on a mobile device. It's not the user interface that, you know, uh, Megan, the design and, and, and engineering team are doing it. It just, it won't, it'll, and by the way, it'd be like taking a bucket of fresh water to the Santa Monica <laughs> Pier and throwing it in the ocean. It's not, if you don't do it at scale, it's mm -hmm. not gonna matter. It won't, it won't matter. If Netflix tomorrow, you know, which has got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new shows every, you know, just coming out every week, there's new things coming and it's great stuff. So let's just say they go make a few of these. It's not going to change that service, and it certainly isn't what their customer is coming from. And I respect one thing. Uh, um, there are many things I respect about Reed uh, Hastings, but one above all else is he is one of those people that is focused about do one thing great. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, you're, you are to come at a moment in time in which Netflix has a level of competition coming after their lunch, the likes of which they have never, ever seen before. And for them to continue to win at the game that they are playing, they need to get to 300 million subscribers you know, over the next X number of years. That is existential for them. Worried about Quibi is so far out of the line of sight. For him. What we, we are irrelevant to him. Right. So I, I, I want to get, I actually want to get to starting about, talking about Netflix and larger things that are going on in the industry. But first, there's a, a quote that Reed Hastings gave recently, which to me seemed very profound, which is he said, we as Netflix compete, far, or, or something to the effect of we worry far more about competing with Fortnite than we do with HBO. Yeah. Um, interpret that for me, tell me what you guys make of that, and, and then tell me, understanding that we live in this incredibly fractured media environment where engagement comes in many forms, where does Quibi fit into that equation? So go to Meg's thing. If you are 25 to 35 years old, right now, between seven in the morning and seven at night, you spend five hours on a smart device. And you're doing four things. You are communicating, collaborating, you're on social media, you are playing casual games, and right now, today, you are watching 70 minutes of short form content. We know that, that's not a, that's not a speculative thing, it's a fact. That's what we're going after. We're going after 20 minutes of that 70 minutes, which by the way, six years ago it was six minutes, a year and a half ago it was 40 minutes, and today it's 70 minutes. So people love being able to watch great short form content on the go. We wouldn't exist today were it not for two things. One, YouTube. So 10, 12 years ago, this, this amazing egalitarian democratized platform comes along completely uh, uh, fueled by user-generated content. All of us making our cat videos and putting them up there. And it actually, a lot of it had, you know, was charming and interesting and we all, you know, had a lot of fun. Google comes along, buys it, and invests many billions of dollars in it and builds it out into the greatest media platform ever in the history of this planet by a factor of probably 200x the next biggest thing. There are two billion monthly active users on, on YouTube. It's extraordinary. And they then bring monetization to it, where for creators, now there's a way that you, what you make, if you wanna make something and actually have a professional career doing it, 
you, there's a way of actually, everybody can actually make money on that platform. It did great till about three years ago in which it plateaued. Mm -hmm. And it plateaued because they have something called programmatic advertising, which is basically a nice way of saying very low CPM. And the result of that is, is that if you are a professional and you're making content on that platform, you can't afford to spend more than about $3,000 a minute. Right? Now, people with $3,000 a minute are doing incredibly innovative and creative things and, 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 and you know, are, are entrepreneurial and wonderful things that are coming out of it. However, in the world that we're talking about, in terms of professional Hollywood content, we spend $100,000 a minute. And honestly, I'm, I'm, our hat's off to how clever they are with their $3,000 a minute. You know, when you give J.J. Abrams $100,000 a minute, or Guillermo del Toro, or Steven Spielberg, or, you know, Anton Fuqua, or all of these people who are now making content for Quibi, they're going to do something exceptional. These are super gifted storytellers. Give them good resources, they're going to blow us all away. I have no doubt. We're starting to read it and see it and shoot it. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that people are going to be blown away by this. I think one other thing I would say here is when you start a new business or decide to join a company, I have sort of three things I think about. First is, are trends in your direction? Is wind at your back? I have been in businesses where wind is at my back. It was called eBay. I have been in businesses where wind was gale force in my face. It was called HP. It is way better <laughs> to be on trend. <laughs> and this is definitely on trend. This, that growth rate of the amount, number of minutes that people are watching video on their phone is up and to the right, as we say in Silicon Valley. And it's only going to get bigger because of 5G. And we are a perfect use case for 5G. So I think that's the other thing to think about. We are not only take, we're, I don't think we're going to actually steal minutes from anyone else. We are going to help expand that market and maybe accelerate the growth of the market. And all boats will rise in a rising tide there. So that's how I think about it. So uh, the content that is going to live here, and, and before we get out of here, we'll announce some new content that you guys have coming down the pipeline. But Help me understand, like, is it, you know, Lena Waithe is doing a show about sneaker culture. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's going to look something somewhat different from a Steven Spielberg or a J.J. Yeah. J. J. Abrams show. Well, yes. This, what, what is the full expanse of your content? It's, it's the sort of premium shows from great directors. We know it's personalities uh, like Lena Waithe that feel a little more reality TV. Is there a news aspect? to yes. what's yes. going to run on so it, it, it actually falls into several tiers. So our lighthouses, these sort of big uh, series for us. So a series for us is, uh, you know, from 10 to 15, 16 chapters long. They are these sort of film, you know, stories. And, you know, we've, <clears throat> we've announced a couple of these things, like Sam Raimi doing 50 States of Fear. It's an anthology. So Sam has gone out and curated every state in America, the scariest ass story he could find. <laughs> and what he loved about this platform is, is that he could do one story that actually could be eight or 10 minutes long, and another one that could actually be you know, two hours you know, long in it. it. He can expand and contract to fill the right story idea <clears throat> for it. Um, we, we are um, uh, doing things that are comedies, we are doing things that are dramas, we're doing things that are thrillers. It's, it is a broad mix at that, uh, at that sort of lighthouse. And we will publish a new series every other Monday. So every wow. other Monday, 52 weeks a year, we will come out with a new lighthouse series that is you know, a, a, a two to two and a half hour piece. We're then making, to answer your question, which is, the other thing that uh, uh, I think is unique that we're doing is, is we're, we are actually making information convenient. And I want to go back here to something that I think Meg touched on, which is if, if what our ambition is to do what HBO did in terms of narrative, storytelling, the other ambition that we have is to make information as convenient as Spotify made music. So here's an interesting thing. Six years ago, seven years ago, all music was free, 35 million titles. You could type any title you know, into your device and instantly be able to, to play it. And we put our own playlist together and you know, would share them with friends and stuff like that. Here we are six years later. There are 150 million people paying $10 a month. It's the same music. It didn't change, Dylan. It's literally the same 35 million 
uh, titles there in it. What did they do? They made it convenient. I don't know about any of you. I cannot remember the last time I actually typed a title of a song you know, to, to search for it. Why? I go to Spotify. They've created a playlist for me. They give me recommendations. They have these features. I don't have to work for it. And that, for all of us, is actually quite valuable. Information today is where music was six or seven years ago. Ubiquitously available and not convenient. Mm -hmm. So by That's why example, I started a newsletter. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, you're, you, you, but you do it in text. Nobody's doing it in video. So what we're doing in video is, by example, every day you will get up at 6 a.m. and at 6 p.m., we will deliver to you a six and a half minute Qual, you know, network quality production, here's the headline news, hosted by somebody who has trust and can be as compelling to this generation as Peter Jennings was to my generation, right? So to be the convenience of going to one place and in six and a half minutes, give me the, the news of the day is great. Here's an interesting thing. The most trusted brand of millennials today around news Anybody want to guess what it is? Not Instagram. <laughs> Not B BBC. Among Americans. <laughs> Among Americans, BBC. Yeah. So we actually have a global news at 12 noon that will be produced for us by BBC. Um, sports. Sports highlights. 20 years ago, you got from Sports Center. Today, you go to Sports Center, two highlights, and then five people yell at each other for 20 minutes. Just give me the sports highlights. All right, here's one for you. MTV, I used to get my music news from Kurt Loder. Anybody else here get a <laughs> Kurt Loder? Okay. There's like three people in the you, audience who even know who Kurt Loder well, is. There are three other people that are 68 years old, obviously, in the audience. Everyone else is like, who's Kurt Loder? <laughs> so, but there is no place to go today in video to get music news. Now, literally, I could go through 15 categories of things that we would call our daily essentials. They are things that people need and they are things that people want. Here's another one for you. It's my favorite one. I would pay $5 a month just for this one. Every day you will get up and there will be a six and a half minute, the best of last night's late night. Mm -hmm. Right? Who doesn't want the convenience of that, of going across all the late night shows and actually curating and putting together what was the best skit, who had the best monologue, who had the best guest across all of the late night shows. Now, right now, today, you all know we can go on YouTube, we can go to different sites and go aggregate that and, you know, get to it. It takes, it's too much work. Could you just make that easy for me? Right. So, another part of Quibi. So, Mark Twain famously said, Are you feeling any better? I'm just, well, we're working you, hard you, up here. We're selling our money? ass off and you're just kind of like going, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for more investment, you came to the wrong place. Sure, no, um, just, not look, right now. Just, 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 just a little less doubt. <laughs> We're not that far. No, look, I, this, this goes back to what the industry, when, when I talk to executives of other media companies and tech companies, what they tell me is it sounds great. And if they can get there, great. And when they get there, we will swoop in and we will milk that for all it is worth. But they're not ready to go there and they're not, they have doubts. They have, they have. Well, they do, but they put their money up. They put their content up and they put their resources up. And you know what? For us, that's all we could possibly ask for. And everybody has a right to be a doubter, right? Sure. Until it delivers, it's okay. Everybody can be a doubter. Are you Me, having? Me, I'm 100%. Are She's you having 99. fun with this? This is, this is, we're opposites here. You haven't seen that routine yet in this. So this is yin and yang. So just so you. So let's, let's, let's we'll, we'll come back to the, the trends in the industry. But first, so tell me about the, how this came together. So uh, Meg and I go back uh, to the Jurassic era. We were both at the Disney company together and um, uh, worked in different areas. Our paths crossed a little bit. Um, and... Uh, I, uh, I got fired and went on uh, to do a few other things. Meg went on to, uh, was uh, employee number 30 uh, at a little company called eBay and built eBay into this $80 billion business. And we sort of stayed friends over the years. And when I started DreamWorks Animation, as a, we went public as a public company, I uh, invited Meg to come be a board member. Uh, and so that we had three years that we were together um, uh, where she was on the board. And then 
Uh, she called me up one day and she said, uh, uh, I have a big ambition and I, I know this may be a little disappointing, but I'm going to run for governor. I went, okay, well, of California. That's, that's great. I went, where? And she said, California. And I went, okay, and as what? And she said, as a Republican. And I said, have you lost your fucking mind? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you do know that that just is like not going to work, right? I mean, you're one of the smartest people I know. How like, can you run for governor in the state of California as a Republican? So I you might know, have failed the IQ test. I might run as a Republican. <laughs> Anyway, she went on to uh, run Hewlett Packard, did a genius job there of taking this 20th century enterprise and yanking it into the 21st uh, century. You know, 400,000 employees, a $175 billion business, and, you know, kind of wrestled that thing to the ground. And I read on the wire one day, uh, you know, now about a year and a half ago, that she was stepping down after six years. She told them she was going to do it for five. And I called her up. You know, it was right around Thanksgiving time. I called her up and I said, wow, you like your, and we had worked together when I was at DreamWorks. They, HP was our provider. And uh, I said, you know, uh, what are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going away for a couple of months. No, I said, what are you doing tomorrow night? Mm -hmm. And she knows me well enough to know. She said, well, I guess I'm probably having dinner with you by, this, <laughs> by, by that question. So I literally I flew up to Northern California and we went to a Japanese restaurant in Palo Alto and we had a three and a half dinner. And I poured my heart and soul out, and I said to her, I can't do this alone. Not possible. And, and you, everything I'm not, you are. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. You know everything I don't know. Please, what please, is, please. What do you know that he doesn't know? Everything. <laughs> well, I want to get into business with someone else. <laughs> so it's actually a very powerful combination. With Jeffrey and I, there are not two more different people on the planet than Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg. So Jeffrey is a right brain storyteller. And I am a left brain. I'm not an engineer by training, but I've been in Silicon Valley for so long, I might as well be. And I am deeply analytical. And you know, Jeffrey will argue in stories and allegories. And I will say, Jeffrey, do you have any data to suggest that what you have just said is true? You sound like me <laughs> now. And he will say, Yeah, I beat out of her pretty good here, Dylan. Not say, you, but her, yeah. It take? He'll say, No, I don't have any data. And, um, but it's true. And then I will, I will come with data, facts, total available market size, market segmentation, market research. And he will say, you know, Meg, not everything yields to analysis. And I'll say, no, not everything does, but most things do. <laughs> and so it's this actually one plus one equals five. Mm -hmm. And um, we've, we've learned over the last year, because I've been at, at Quibi now for a year. I was employee number one in March of last year. And we've learned to work together in a way that is super powerful. And what we are trying to do has not been done before, which is combine the engineering and the engagement of the platform with this incredible content in a way where we have raised a lot of money and we're making some pretty big bets. So it's a, it's a terrific combination. Um, and then there are days, and we often say, you know, if we were 20 years younger, we might have killed each other by now. But uh, you know that experience and, and friendship. What Jeffrey didn't tell you, he was running the Walt Disney Studios. I was um, in Strap Planning, and uh, you know Strap Planning was sort of designed to put Jeffrey in a box at the Walt Disney Company. Yeah, it worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and honestly, I think I was the only Strap Planner that you actually even kind of liked. So, <laughs> so the you guys you guys are hustling really really hard. You've been. No, is that noticeable? This is. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you where they've been, but this is the third city you've been in today. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, correct me if I'm wrong, you have breakfast two to three times a day. Yes. To meet with people. Yes. So you can meet at three times as many people as everyone yes. else is meeting. Yes. You guys hustle really hard. Making the, the Mark Twain thing I was going to mention earlier, he, he famously wrote, if I'd had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. The, the fact that you're making. Sh Short form, I know it's not short form, but the fact that you're making shorter Quibbies. content. Quibbies. Does not... Here's the goal, just to answer that. Yeah. Five years from now, we want to come back on this stage, and if we got this right, there will have been the era of movies, the era of television, the era of Quibi, and Quibi will be to what you call short form, what Kleenex is to tissue, uh -huh. what Google is to search. That's the ambition. If that Big happens enough? in five... <laughs> If that happens in five years, can I interview you on this stage? 
Or I'll interview you. I express too much doubt. <laughs> I'll interview you on this stage. So back then, Dylan, you downy <laughs> motherfucker, what was going on? What, what's the matter with you? <laughs> oh, great, great. Yeah, that'd Jeffrey? be great. We'll do a, Jeffrey. There'll be a, there'll be a cage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. All right. Fuck Quibi. Let's let's talk. Let's talk about the rest of the industry. You you, you mentioned that Netflix uh, has an existential crisis if they can't get to three hundred. No, no, no. They don't have an existential crisis. They they they. Uh, we should all have such an existential crisis. I think that they have a challenge in, ahead of them in that they need to gain that scale, right? While everybody else is now trying to come in and eat their lunch, something they've never experienced before. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they can do it? Do you yes. think they can get to yes. 300? Yes, yeah. no question. Why? What is, what is the advantage they have? Because I look at people, I look at Disney starting its own service and having Disney, start Marvel, Pixar, Lucasfilm. Yeah, but you're, 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 you're making a presumption that it's a zero sum game. Yeah, somebody wins not. and somebody loses. We don't yeah. see it that way. I think that Netflix is definitively going to be a winner. I will also say more boldly here today, I bet the ranch that Disney is also going to be a winner, right? Now, are they gonna win at the same game? Absolutely not. I don't think Bob Iger's tr trying to play the same game. The media wants him to play the same game. They want to create a horse race there in it. That, he doesn't have to do, but, he doesn't have to beat them or even tie them to win. He just needs to get a direct relationship with his customers. He has built and has, here's the thing that's just, think about this, okay? In, a, in the history of business, I don't think you can ever find another instance where uh, a company, at the height of its success in every single thing that it does, it's number one. Number one in movies, number one in sports, number one in merchandising, number one in theme parks. You could just go through all of these things in it. And, and the most respected and beloved brands, number, they just saw a study, they're like number four, number five, most sure. trusted brand in the world in it. The guy has won in every single respect, right? And by the way, he's one month old, uh, younger than I am in it. He could have dropped that mic and walked out of there just a complete winner. No. He said, I am here today. I hold the baton of this enterprise. My job is to make sure that when I pass it to the next person, I have set it up to succeed for the next 50 years. And so he has made this incredibly bold bet that I don't think anybody's ever done anything like this. He bought a company for $75 billion. He's about to spend many, many, many tens of billions of dollars more to succeed at it. And I would say to you, as confident as I am as Quibi is going to succeed, and I am, I feel that way in terms of what he's going to do, and it's not about beating Netflix. Fair, and I, I should, by the way, I'm very bullish on Disney even more so than Netflix, but at a certain point, correct me if I'm wrong, there are only a certain number of seats at the table when you think about how much the average consumer is going to spend on a monthly basis for all of this content. Well, here's the facts. Right now, today, the average, the average household in America spends $120 a month. That is, in fact, what they are spending, okay? Sure. You have a generational change that is occurring because the new, this next generation, and it has begun with millennials, are saying, I don't want to pay for things I don't use anymore. If I'm not watching sports, or I'm not watching history, or I'm not, whatever the things are I'm not doing. Right now, we all pay for all of these things, whether we watch them or not. And they're just saying, no, and there are now direct-to-consumer platforms that are being built that are giving the power to the customer. Now, I would say to you, if you look out, and I think this is a long way coming because this is, this is a slow decline, it's not a cliff here, and you look into the future <clears throat> and you can see a world in which people are actually gonna have five, six, seven subscriptions to different services. And I suspect three of those, are, in fact, are going to be rich media services. I think one of them is going to be music. I'm 100% sure of that, right? I think one of them is going to be Quibi. Right? So when you look at the, the sort of basket of things that you're going to do, and by the way, that's still a lot cheaper than $120 a month. And now you're paying for what you actually chose to watch. Sure. Um, what do you guys make of uh, the changes that have happened at Warner Media with Richard Plepler getting out at HBO, Bob Greenblatt coming in, this sort of notion of bringing the, the, the brand quality of HBO to scale? 
Well, listen, I, let me go back to the question you asked before, because I do want to add one thing is, if you look at the history of when new categories are created, what happens is a company creates a new category, then everyone goes, this is a great idea, it's a growing market, I can make um, a business out of it, and you get many, many entrants. And I think you're seeing that in this direct-to-consumer, over-the-top services. Everyone's coming in. And what happens is that grows the market, gives customers a lot of choice, and then inevitably there is a shrinking of the number of players, usually one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you'll see in the next three or four years, massive numbers of new entrants into this, and then it will winnow itself out as customers say, you know, listen, I don't need seven of these, I need six, or I need five, or I need four. So I think, and listen, HBO is a remarkable it's, it's remarkable what Richard has done over many years. And, but they're on a new path now. They're, they're part of AT&T. They have a slightly different mission. And this is, you know, companies change and grow and they adapt. And I think you're seeing, you know, the natural change and, and growth here. And I think everyone will know in, you know, four or five years how this all shook out. Yeah, I think Richard, I mean, like, as, as Meg said, Richard Leppler has done a, just a spectacular job, built one of the great branded media, you know, platforms of all time an incredible curator, an intellectual, uh, a man of incredible curiosity. There will be another great act for Richard Pleffler. But as Meg said, he wasn't the right horse for this. You know, it's not the same horse doesn't run every course, mm -hmm. right? And I think you have in Bob Greenblatt, again, another world-class, you know, talent. And, 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 you know, who was ready for something new, different, exciting. And the fact that he comes there with no baggage to it allows him to to be able to let go of everything and anything in it and so that kind of change is you know oh. inevitable and probably healthy and I think sometimes when companies really need to change or there's a whole different industry structure i mean sometimes it's you you have to have i mean uh, as an outsider HP had to have an outsider come in to make the changes that were necessary because if you had been there for 10 or 20 or 30 years, it was hard for you to imagine that it would be any other way. And so I think this is just the natural evolutionary course and business is changing at lightning speed. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. You know, we used to have a lot more time to adapt 30 years ago. You have nanoseconds to adapt now. Right. The change is really fast. Barry Diller said recently that Hollywood is irrelevant. What did you make of that? I'm not going there. <laughs> well, no, but it's this relevant idea, to me. This idea that the studio, I mean, that the studios no longer run the show, that now you do have like the Netflixes and the Amazons, and we're just in a different. I, you know, I think it's I. You know, I worked for Barry Diller for 11 years, um, and uh, I learned in 11 years don't ever disagree with Barry Diller, <laughs> but I'm not going to agree with him about this one. Okay, last last Netflix question. There have been reports that Steven Spielberg is trying to block Netflix from. Oscar viability. So I, I, I actually talked to Stephen about this yesterday. Um, uh, we were partners for 20 years. Uh, and, um, and by the way, I continue to, every six weeks he comes into Quibi and we pitch him all the ideas that we're doing and we, we uh, you know, get his input and feedback. And, uh, uh, but I talked to him yesterday and uh, I asked him very specifically, I don't have any skin in that game anymore. I don't make movies anymore. And so it's not really, even though I, I spent most of my life and career there, I was fascinated by that. And uh, when I reached him yesterday, he said, I absolutely did not say that. <laughs> so what did he say? He didn't say anything to that. And what, he actually said nothing. So what happened is, is a journalist um, was onto a, a story about this, uh, had heard some rumor about Stephen having, and it's been written about during the Academy Awards stuff that was going on, and something was attributed to him. And so the journalist called a spokesperson to get a comment about it and honestly just sort of twisted the things around. And I can tell you as an absolute fact, one, Stephen didn't say that. Two, he is not going to the Academy in April with some plan. He doesn't have a plan. He loves movies, obviously, and the movie theater experience, but has not opined at all, nor has he lobbied for some specific thing. What he does know is, is there is a realignment coming, and he wants the outcome of that to be to be a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. He wants movie theaters and that communal experience of hundreds of people being able to go in and see something on a big screen. He wants to see that uh, 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 you know, prosper. Now, does that have to prosper with a 90-day window or a 120-day window, which is where it is today? 
I don't think anybody involved in the business actually believes that the case, including the movie exhibitors. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the, he is not actually opined about where he thinks the next version of that is, but, but uh, and he certainly didn't make that quote. It's good to know. I feel like the, the spokesperson should probably get back on the phone and let the reporter know. <laughs> That's not what Are you said. speaking on, report, on, on behalf of all reporters, or that particular reporter? <laughs> um, all right, I, one more question, then I, I want to get to the new content that you guys are, are going to roll out. Uh, you, you're, you're a titan in Hollywood. When you watch the Oscars, like, what do you make just gen Forget about Netflix versus Disney. Forget about Quibi. Forget about, like, when you watch the Oscars, having been in Hollywood for as long as you have, what do you make about where the industry is at? Should Roma have won Best Picture? Should it be entitled to win Best Picture? Should Green Book have won Best Picture? Uh, it, it, it are, it are, is Hollywood celebrating the stories that people are actually watching, people actually care about? Listen, I, again, only because I, I really am an old dog at this, and I've been doing it for way too long, and I have seen these moments time and time again. I, I, I am not capable in any fashion, shape, or form of predicting the Academy. You know, I was on the wrong side of, you know, uh, Private Ryan and Shakespeare in Love. I still haven't recovered from that. It's 20 some odd <laughs> years ago, and you look at today, and I, by the way, I love Shakespeare in Love. I think it is a, just an absolute, you know, a, a delight and, and, a, and, a, and a wonderful, wonderful, very inventive and re, very creative movie. Private Ryan, Ryan's one of the greatest films ever made, really, one of the most extraordinary films. And with the perspective of 20 years later in this in it, you would say, that probably wasn't right. Now, we had controversy last year. They, at least this year, they read the name right, <laughs> right? right? So it's not a high bar, but we got there this year, right? <laughs> so again, you know, Roma is an amazing movie. Green Card actually is a very heartfelt movie. I know there's Green some controversy. I'm sorry, Green Book, sorry. <laughs> I made Green Card. That was a lot 20 years ago, too. Green Book. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's... In the world we live in today, there's controversy where there is no controversy, there's controversy where there is controversy in it, and so that's kind of the world we live in. I, I can only tell you, Meg and I, I invited Meg and her husband to come watch the Academy Awards you know, with me in my home, and we had a whole bunch of food, and you know, it was like football Sunday for in our house, <laughs> right? And, and we just had a lot of fun, and my kids and everybody were all there in it. And here's the thing. I actually enjoyed the awards. I thought it moved at a different pace this year in it. I love that we got to hear people talk more about what this meant to them. <clears throat> I thought that moment with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, when you got to that close up on that piano in that moment, is truly one of the most epic, elegant TV moments that I have ever seen. Just that moment of where they got to and it, that alone was That's like, right. Well, that. Right? And so I, you know, that was so powerful and so emotional and live, right? The fact that you could pull that off in that moment, I mean, I just, for, for civilians, you just look at it and you go, wow, it makes my heart sore. For people that are professional, not only does it make your heart sore, it makes your brain explode because you realize the impossibility of actually pulling off what they did that night. It yeah. was a high wire act beyond belief. In it. So, so I like the Academy Awards. I'm, I'm, maybe that's a, not such a popular idea, but I thought this year actually was better than it had been in a while. I think they just need to figure out how to have more of those moments across a three hour period as opposed to one moment. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you produce them next year. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know someone I could talk to? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I've got ideas. Okay. This, this, is, this, is, this is the most exciting part. You guys have more shows you want to announce that you're well, working on. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody said if you're going to come here, at least, you know, serve up a few more things. And so, you know, right now today, uh, you know, at Quibi, so let me put this into context for you. Um, in the first year, so we'll go live April of next year, and we will publish every week uh, over 100 pieces of original content, right? So... We have to make 5,300, 5,400 pieces of content in a 12-month period of time, so it's a, it's a pretty Herculean undertaking. Yeah. As I said, we've had just an amazing uh, uh, 
uh, sort of avalanche, if you will, in a, in a good way, a tsunami of things that have come at us. We've had over 2,000 submissions uh, that have been made to us in, in just the last couple of months. And there's some real gems that are doing it. And as they're coming together, we're sort of letting, you know, just giving little bits and pieces out there into the world. So we want to share four new ideas uh, today of things that are just taking shape and form in it. So they're kind of at the beginning of the beginning, but it does start to show more and more creatively what we hope is the, the deliverables, what we can get to. So um, uh, we should talk, maybe, May, why don't you talk about what we're doing with Telemundo? Yeah, so um, as you know, this generation, 25 to 30 year olds, your generation, is the most diverse generation in American history. And we want to make sure that we are representative of our to-be audience. And uh, so we have gone to um, Telemundo, to Cesar Conde, who runs Telemundo, which is part of NBC Universal. And they have one of the most um, widely watched films in America today, which is TV called- TV shows. TV shows, sorry. Six, six seasons. Yeah, and it's called El, uh, El Señor de Cielo. And it's about two drug lords who have, and have a very interesting story. And it's remarkable. It's the number four rated cable television show in America, and it is in Spanish. And so we went to them and we said, you know, what is the question that you get asked the most? And they said, you know, the question they get asked the most is, who are these people? What's their backstory? And uh, so Jeffrey said to them, well, what we should do is we should do the origin story of El Señor de Cielo, um, sort of like Godfather II. So we're going to be making that with um, Telemundo and Cesar Conte. So that'll be a three-hour story, which you literally go back to their childhood, and you now tell it up to where the first season of the show began. Uh, and I said that'll be about, you know, about three hours long. And the same creative team that has made that series for six years is making it. And it will be in Spanish on our platform subtitle. Incredible. That's yeah. great. So uh, one of the things that we're doing a ton of, and you'll hear a lot more about it over time, is, is uh, reality and alternative things. And we're looking at all of the, what, what are the things that we can do uniquely on these devices that you can't do on a television set, and some of which are interactive, and you know, gamification. And so you know, our goal will be to find what is our version of Survivor, what is our version of you know, The Bachelor, Bachelorette, and, you know, America's Got Talent, all of those things. And so in that regard, we have a show that we're developing right now with uh, Scooter Braun, who's really kind of one of the great uh, entrepreneurs in the music business uh, right now, which is a, will be a music competition show in which he will produce it and actually be one of the judges on it. And it will have to be unique and differentiated, you know, on this platform, because you're getting it in, in chapters. Um, we're also doing, um, something I actually was uh, ex uh, you know, excited about because it just, you know, um, whenever you can do things that are heartfelt, it's always great. And so uh, we have a show that we're doing with um, uh, Jennifer Lopez uh, called Thanks a Million, and her company is producing it. And uh, she's actually going to, to do the first chapter of this. So there are going to be 10 of these chapters in which 10 different people are going to do the following. So we went to Jennifer and said, um, we want you to find somebody in, back in your early part of your life, either in your childhood or early in your career, wherever, whatever you want, who is that person who did the most selfless thing for you that changed your life? And then you're going to go give them $100,000. And then with the caveat, they have to go give $50,000 to someone who did that for them. And then they have to go give $25,000 who did that, did that for them. And so it's literally pay it forward. And so we'll do that with uh, 10 different people. We'll each do, do it, and we'll tell the story of how each of those people changed somebody's life in some great way. It's incredible. Um, and then uh, the fourth one we wanted to share with you today, it's interesting because we actually had a little bit of a conversation. And so uh, the, the name of the project uh, is called the Frat Boy Genius. So anybody want to guess what it's about? Frat boy genius. That's one more to anybody. There, there you go. go. That man just said it there. Evan Spiegel. So it is the story of um, uh, how he built and created Snapchat, which is one of the great social platforms of our time. And we want to tell a story that is as compelling and interesting um, about the creation of Snapchat and Evan's story as um, social network was uh, for Facebook. 
I can hear the alarm bells going off in Santa Monica right now because you guys are making something about Evan Spiegel. That's going to be really interesting. I think that'll be a really fascinating. He should be flattered. He should be flattered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since I've got two and a half minutes, I want to ask one more question. Uh-oh. You ran for governor as a Republican against Jeffrey's advice. You are a big Democratic donor. Against Meg's advice. <laughs> <laughs> We, we're, we're wandering into like a really, really crazy election cycle. What do you guys make of it? What do you make of the Democratic field, Jeffrey? What do you, you know, um, Meg, what are you going to do if the tr you got to choose between Donald Trump and, you know, and Elizabeth Warren or Bernie <laughs> Sanders? Is, you know, what, where, where are you guys at on 2020? Um, I think we're sort of like most uh, at the beginning of the beginning. And um, I don't think yet... Uh, um, you know, we're at a place, a moment in time in which uh, anybody needs to sort of or should be actually making any great declarations. Um, I, I believe as a country, there is something that is going to happen in the next 12 months and so that right at almost to the week of where we are right now, a year from now, I think our country uh, will come to a fork in the road. And when I say our country, I mean those people um, uh, that probably fall closer into, you know, my, my perspective of, of this. It's probably about 60% of the country. You know, I'm a moderate, and, and uh, you know, I, uh, I, I think that we, that this group I'm thinking about, are going to have a point in time in, at, at this year from now in which we're going to make a decision to go one of two ways. And what those two ways are, are either going to be somebody new, fresh, try, untested, but exciting, and ideas that just feel right. We've done it before. We actually can do it again. And, and I think that can happen. The alternative to that is, is that we may get to a, that exact same you know, fork in the road and decide for the next chapter here, in the sort of political path and the leadership path of our country, we actually want tried, true, tested, and wisdom. Somebody we actually know exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to do it by virtue of who they have been and the acts that they have done in the past. I actually have no way of knowing which of those two things are going to be more compelling. A lot of that is going to be determined by the person delivering that message and how well they deliver that message. And I just don't know how you sit here today and speculate on it. Meg, is it a lonely place being a smart, thoughtful Republican? <laughs> I brought her over to the right side. I mean, the left no, side. Um, as a lifelong Republican, I made a lot of news in the last election where I endorsed Hillary Clinton. Right. And for those of you who are interested in politics, you know, this is tribal. And so when you are a lifelong Republican and you endorse the Democrat candidate, it creates, I mean, it was, you know, all my Republican friends were like, what have you done? <laughs> um, but, um, but I still think it was the right thing to have done. And we'll see what happens here. I mean, I think what I would tell you is, on a scale of, as someone who has been in politics for a long time and watched what's happening, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is worried, I'm like a 12 in terms I'm worried about this country. Yeah. And um, I'm just super, you know, I just really, really worry about what's happening here. And um, so... We'll see what happens in, in, in you know, 2020, and uh, you know, obviously I'll make a choice then, but, but I'm hoping that um, you know, some things are different and we have choices that we don't have today. Can I do something? Can, is it possible to put the house lights up? Can we put the house lights up? Oh, wow. In this room, um, how, put your hand up if you think Donald Trump will be in the White House in 2021. Wow. Okay. Well, we know where this room is. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to say I have doubts about Quibi, but I've got less doubts after that. Thank you guys very Thank much you very for much. taking the time. Thank I really you. appreciate it.